live stream motivated mostly by the candlelight vigil that we held at McAllister the other day. That when we saw the importance of talking about the issues and seeing where people are, that I, we decided that it's a good idea to do a at least a short live stream that is an open live stream. I My plan tonight is to just share and talk a little bit myself for about 15, 20 minutes. And then I thought we would make du'a together. I would like you, if you have something you would like me to talk about or discuss after I talk or something you'd like to share, to go ahead and put it in the chat box. If you haven't been to one of our rooms before, then you might not know how it works. But it's fairly simple, and I'm not going to worry you with all of the little fun educational pieces of it. Just you can see the chat box and go ahead and type in the chat box whenever you want to. At this point, I have, uh, let me see, four admins on who are helping me. And so if I miss your question, do know that they will probably get it for me. Is that uh, correct? One, I have one admin here with me right here. Excellent. Okay. Very good. So if we forget, if I miss it, and if I still haven't come to it, and you're, it's not because I'm purposely ignoring you, it's because it went too fast through the chat and I just missed it. So either they will try to get it, or if you find me not uh, doing it, go ahead and retype it. The um, situation that we're faced with today is a, first of all, a very fascinating look at three people who were tragically killed in their homes, Ziya Barakat, Yusr Abu Salha, and Razan Abu Salha. And these three young people have had an outpouring of emotion from people that know them and people that don't know them. And one thing I want to say is that as Muslims, we recognize that this type of legacy that we're seeing really is a sign of the goodness of those people and the acceptance of their deeds of this dunya while they were here. So that's the first thing I want to say, that we have to recognize that as Muslims, we don't look at things in the same way as non-Muslims, we can say, or as people of faith, we don't look at things as people that don't recognize the akhirah. So there is a tragedy, certainly, in the death of these three people. There is also something that this death has given our community. And it has given our community an opportunity to talk about racism, to talk about issues of exclusion, Okay, I'm going to pause because I'm seeing people asking about sound. Admins, can you help me here? I have two that asked about sound. Okay, so I'll continue then while uh, those who don't have sound or have any issue, go ahead and admins will help you with that, inshallah. The, it has given us as a Muslim community the opportunity to talk about Racism within our community has given us an opportunity to think about our Muslim community in the context of the United States or in the context of whatever country that we're living in, in a plural society. It has given us the, an opportunity to open and discuss topics that we haven't been discussing. I have, it has also the event itself has brought great fear to some. 
and made many uncomfortable and made a number of people wonder what they might do about their children or their own personal future. And my, and, and I've seen a number of people in tears as they fear for themselves or their families. And we have had a number of other incidents around it, surrounding this particular incident. One that was actually a whole year ago with the death of the young 15 year old boy in Kansas. We had the fire in Houston, the Islamic Center there. We had the Indian man that was beaten. He was a Hindu man, but it's he he looked different. And many feel that he was beaten because many have I've heard people tell me that they believe they believe his beating happened because he was they thought he was a Muslim. I've heard others say that he was beaten because they thought he was black. Either way, it's unacceptable. All of these things are causing despair almost and a lot of stress and a lot of tension in our communities and with our youth and with our adults as well. I have three things that I want to share. When we look at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there are many different stages of the da'wah. Many different stages of the da'wah. One of them is, of course, the Meccan stage. The Meccan stage was a stage of great, great difficulty. Fear. It was a time when Muslims were often tied up and dragged around the, the city. It was a time where one of the companions was wrapped in burlap and put on hot coals to cook. He was forever scarred with those burns. It was a time of economic oppression where the Muslims were given inflated prices or not paid, a number of different ways that the Quraysh attempted to hurt and harm, abuse, and oppress Muslims. The period of Hijra that came in between Mecca and Medina was a period of the decision to move forward. The Prophet وسلم, in that stage of Hijra gave bay'ah to the people of Medina. And in the second bay'ah, where there were two women, there was a promise of defense and support. There's a promise of if there is war that they would stand with the Prophet In Medina, there was hard work in establishing a living example of what it means to be a person of faith, what it means to be a society of faith. And in Medina, there were hardships, many, between the hypocrites of Medina, Bedr, oh, the enemies from outside that were coming in, and the hypocrites from within, and later the issues with neighbors around surrounding Medina. There was plenty of hardship and plenty of what we probably today might define as fear. But the Prophet ﷺ was still building. And we are now called not back to the Meccan stage, alhamdulillah. We are living in, in places that offer great opportunity and great freedoms and great rights and the ability to speak and the ability to use Twitter and Facebook for that which we need and the ability to go forth in positive action wherever we want and whenever we want. We are not living in this stage of hijrah at least not as a general population, because we've already, we're, we've already put it, put to, planted, planted our roots down wherever we are. So we are in Medina, and if we are in Medina, we need to build Medina. We need to build Medina. And in building Medina, this is something that we have, as a community, already been working on. 
looking at the Chapel Hill tragedy tells us that we have a lot more work to do. And there are three pieces that we need to hold on to. Three. One is education. Education of ourselves, education of others, education of our families and our children. We need to go back to roots of education. By that, I mean we need to learn Arabic. We absolutely, as a community, need to learn Arabic. We are and will continue to be an oppressed people until we learn Arabic, until we have some measure of Arabic. We don't have to be fluent. We don't have to be perfect. But we need some type of liturgical Arabic. The example that I've been giving of late is the people of Brazil. They had 65% illiteracy. And 65% is terrible. It's a terrible, terrible situation, 65% of a country to be illiterate. And there is a thinker and an educator, Paulo Freire, some of you may know of him, who developed a system of, teach, of bringing people to literacy. When I think about our Muslim community, 20% are Arab. That means 80% are probably illiterate. Of the 20% that are Arab, Today, there are, there's a large percentage of Arabs that do not have full literacy in Fusha, classical Arabic. There's a push in our countries to learn modern standard Arabic, which is different enough from Fusha that it separates us, us from understanding of certain basic vocabulary words of our early heritage texts. In order for us to come together as a community, we need to learn Arabic, we need to understand our texts, we need to be connected to our heritage texts, our sacred texts, and our heritage texts. We need to be connected to the Qur'an. We need to learn the Qur'an. We need to be learning the Qur'an in a way that we can love the Qur'an. We need to be learning our Islamic sciences and know them. And we need to be learning our secular topics as well. Education. Second piece is community. We have to be out in our community. MashaAllah, I have not seen everything for sure, but what I have seen of the short lives of those who died in Chapel Hill, they were people of service in their profession, within their profession, serving. There was something they did with um, something about Make a Smile or something. Does anybody remember what that group was called, the nonprofit group? Yes, he was a dentist. So there was something that he was doing for the homeless, for low-income kids, and then also they had planned to go overseas and work with refugees in, in their field of dentistry. Refug some, yeah, some kind of smiles organization, exactly. MashaAllah. This is, and as a result, at their death, a number of organizations and a number of non-Muslims were re really remembering them with great full hearts of missing them. It was refugee smiles, yes, with the Syrian refugees, but there was also something that they did in Chapel Hill itself or in their surrounding areas where they were helping the homeless with dental issues. And so what is your issue? What is your specialty? Your community needs you. Your community needs you. Either start a nonprofit, start an organization, or step out and get started. Do it as a family. Do it as a family. See what you can do. A young woman told me yesterday that she was from an abusive relationship and she was going to go to an organization in her town that supports and helps women coming out of abusive relationships. MashaAllah. I was so happy. These are, the, these are the places we need to be seen. These are the places we need to be. That community outstretch is about building Medina. Sha'rawi defines the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in three pieces. One are those who are already, they've answered the call. They've answered the call. So those who are already praying, who call themselves Muslims, who are practicing, they are one group of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another group are those who are Muslims, but they are distant or they don't pray or they're not really sure. And they're not quite sure who they are. Their, their parents perhaps are Muslims, and maybe they don't know anything about it. That's group number two. Group number three, according to Sha'rawi, are the, the 
non-Muslims of the world. The non-Muslims of the world are considered the Ummah of Muhammad as well because he was Rasul al-Alameen. When we start looking at the non-Muslims as part of our Ummah, as part of our family, we will look at them with the loving hearts we need to look at them with. We will look at them with eyes of mercy and a compassionate heart. And we will be able to stretch ourselves outside of our own comfort zone and reach out to all people and help them walk on the path of their life towards a path of faith, towards a path of ashadu la ilaha illallah, ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. It's very important. So this piece of community is attached to that. It's attached to building Medina. Whatever, wherever you are, if you have the wherewithal to start your own organization that can reach out to the community, do it. And if you don't, join someone else's. Get to work and join four of them if you can. Three, six, whatever it is that you are going to do. Find what you're passionate about and bring forth, bring forth your Muslim self into that work. Bring forth your Muslim self into that work. The third piece is ibadah, is worship. And in, early on, in after this uh, first happened, someone said to me, I said, please don't tell us that all we can do is pray. I need to feel like I'm doing something. And I respect that comment, by the way. I understand it. I understand the need to feel like we're working. But it scares me a little bit because we need to also recognize the absolute power of ibadah and our absolute dearth of ibadah today. We are a community that misses fuddled prayers. We are a community that misses fajr. We are a community that misses isha. We are a community that sometimes misses dhuhr or asr in the daytime when we're at work or at school. And we need to be a community that prays all of our prayers, all of the time, on time. By on time, I don't mean in the beginning of time. That's a blessing. But I by on time, I mean in the space of time allotted. In the space of time allotted. This, uh, this concept of prayer is, this is the analogy of prayer is the analogy of our lungs to our body. If our lungs... If you, if you get one collapsed lung, you'll be in great pain, but you'll still be able to breathe. And if you stick with it long enough, you might even be confused and think you're okay. If both lungs collapse, you will die. And as a community, we cannot expect that we are going to be successful in what we do if we are leaving behind our worship. I prefer to call for tahajjud, which is getting up at night. I think it's the keystone habit. I think getting up for tahajjud will cure us of our daily missed prayers. But at the very least, if it's not going to be tahajjud, then we need to be doing our prayers. And yes, making dua, because making dua is powerful, especially if all around the world, one fajr is coming, the next fajr is coming, the next fajr is coming, and people are, are standing and praying, standing and praying, standing and praying, so that at all times, someone on the earth is praying. This brings blessing, and this brings mercy, and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what we need today. I want to talk also about just a tiny bit about a lesson that we as a Muslim community need to learn. We stand as a community divided, and we do, we're divided in a number of ways, but the, the way I want to speak about today is the division of immigrant Muslims and black American Muslims. The black American community has learned how to deal with racism. They've been dealing with it for years. They are good at it. They understand it. They're brave and they know what is, what is going to be the next step of almost any incident. The immigrant community does not know how to deal with racism. In the United States, the immigrant community in general has been professional class, have been upper class, have had privilege attached to them because of their financial uh, enjoyments, I guess I'm going to say here. And, as, and unfortunately, the immigrant community and the black American community have not worked together. 
it is time to stop that. It is time to begin to work together, to reach our hands across mosques and work together, learn from each other. There's so much we can take from each other, so much to learn from each other. When the Prophet ﷺ went to Medina, he brought the muhajireen, those who are coming from Mecca to Medina. And he, the people of Medina and the people of Mecca, the muhajireen and the ansar, he brought them together in partnership. The muhajireen are those who have come to the United States. The people who live here are those who are from here. Each group can offer the other group so much. And the black American Muslim community have been Muslims for a long time. Uh, white Americans are often struggling themselves and don't quite know where they belong. They don't generally have mosques that they go to, but rather they're trying to fit in wherever they can go. We have to find a way to reach across these walls and work together. We absolutely must. The experience, and, and also we need to look at the African American community and say they have survived racism, and we will too. And we as Muslims will as well. Not only, not only we will, will we survive it, we will inshallah move beyond it. And the final point I'm going to make, and I've gone over my 20 minute limit I gave myself, but I'm almost there is that we can also learn from other religious communities in the United States. We need to open our eyes and open our ears and open our hearts and recognize that other religious communities have been through hardship as well. The Jewish community, the Catholic community, the Mormon community. These three communities in the United States have suffered at different times in history, and they have found ways of moving forward. If we recognize them, if we recognize what they have done, we can learn from what they have done. The, each community has done different things. The Catholic community worked a lot in social projects, hospitals, colleges, important institutions where the populace of the United States ended up going and therefore learned to trust the Catholics that were their neighbors. At first, Catholics were not trusted. Jews became very, they became very um, powerful and became people that Others had to go to for help financially or in the, they became part of media and they took on powerful jobs, Mormons as well. And through these, this work that they did, they became part and parcel of the United States. And they did other things as well, lobbying for elementary school acceptance. When I was a little girl, Christmas was for everyone. It didn't matter where you were, what you were from, who you were. And if you were Jewish, too bad. And there, there weren't any Muslims in the school I went to that I know of. And everyone had to sing Silent Night and Jesus songs. I can't remember them now. And not just, not just uh, secular Christmas songs, which there are some, but also uh, Christmas songs that dealt with issues of aqidah. Jewish groups, parent groups, made that end. They stopped that. And as and. And in working with people, developed respect. We can learn from them as well. So as Muslims, we need to learn from our neighbors, learn from other religious groups in the country, what have they done, learn from the experiences of other people who have experienced racism. We need to reach across our mosque walls and join hands with Black American Muslims. Enough. We have to join hands with, out of respect and care and working together. And all the benefit that we can benefit each other. And we need to do the three pieces I said originally, education, community service, and worship. And all of these things will help us walk, move beyond our grief into a place of positive, proactive, energy to make sure that these things don't happen again. InshaAllah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad. I see th uh, two questions over here to my right that you asked earlier. The victims in Chapel Hill are martyrs, right? Answer. The victims in Chapel Hill certainly qualify uh, under most of the definitions of martyrs. They didn't go out seeking to be killed, certainly. 
but they qualify under a very beautiful definition of martyrdom, which is probably the most important definition we can learn. And that is that it is most important in Islam to live fi sabilillah rather than to die fi sabilillah, if that makes sense. And they were living fi sabilillah and killed because of that. Allahu Akbar. That is certainly a definition of martyrdom. And probably the most important definition that we can hold on to today. Uh, I don't understand. Rabata admin Rabata am according to Sha'rawi, can I have the other I'm I don't understand that question, I'm sorry. I'm going to Hidayat's question. How can I, as a young female student in engineering, do well in school and ensure I leave a good legacy just like the young three of Chapel Hill? I find it difficult to balance between community involvement and school and personal about it. Excellent question. While you are, first of all, first easy answer is going to be time management. Time management is a serious and important thing that we all need to learn. We need to learn how to stop wasting time and start using time. Use our morning hours. The blessing of the Ummah is in its early morning hours, so use your early morning hours. If you're staying up late and sleeping in late, you're not going to have enough time to do all the things you want to do. So A, first of all, go to bed early, get up early, and your work will get done, and you'll be able to add things to your schedule. Minimum weekly requirements, this isn't an RDA, this is a minimum weekly requirement of spiritual success, is one hour a week of taking, of, of taking in and one hour a week of giving. So at the very least, you should be doing that and that in and of itself. If we are all doing that, our communities are going to be cared for. I'm not sure, Mikal, which word you're asking me. I apologize. And so if you could try to spell it, maybe then I'll... Um, we're not quite sure about how to serve within what capacity. Okay, so we look at so if we look at ourselves and our talents and what we're good at and what we enjoy doing, and we think about how can we bring those talents outside. And very often, women especially underestimate their ability to help, underestimate their ability to reach out. So it's important as women that you don't underestimate yourself, that you see what you can do. From the simplest thing of babysitting someone's children so she can attend a class, and then you can switch. She can take care of your children so you can attend a class. From that very simple thing to taking on a little, a small class of children and, and helping them with Quran or helping them enjoy their faith. Joy, we need to bring joy back to our communities and joy back to our, into our lives. We need to bring joy into our lives, into the lives of our children. Or whatever it is that you are interested in, Mesara, and working on that. Um, yeah, I don't know, maybe I'm, Maybe you're looking for something else more specific, so why don't you, maybe you could specify the question a little bit, and then I'll. Wa alaikum salam Latifa, ahlan wa sahlan. We're so sorry for your loss and the loss of all of, all of our community, uh, the loss that we are all enduring, and the loss of all Muslims around the world that are suffering in any way. This, the tragedy of that weekend was that the same day, Duma, a village in Syria, was flattened. So we are, certainly facing a lot of tragedy. And that's why it's so important to build our Medina. Uh, how can we bring the African American and the rest of the Indian population together? Any suggestions? Well, I think we just need to stand up and do it. We need to start doing, making activities where we come together. Go into a, whatever community you're from, go to the other one and make some friends. Or build up an institution that is welcome to all and take advantage of that. It's, uh, it's very important and it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. We need to learn how to trust each other. We're not going to trust each other right away, but it's, it's important that we begin to learn how to trust each other. We need to come together. We absolutely must come together at the, at the, part, at the leadership level and at population and citizenry level, if you will, or members of the Ummah level. It's very important that we come together. Okay, um, when you speak about martyrdom, you said it is more important. It is more important 
what I said, Mikal, is it's more important to live uh, that's what I didn't say, in the cause of God. It's more important to live in the cause of God than to seek death in the cause of God, if that makes sense. That's what I said. Just a minute to fix my computer. Okay. There is much lethargy and fear in the community trying to organize youth forums for discussion. Well, my advice is be brave. Be brave and let it be okay to open up a forum for discussion, have only three or four people there. Let that be okay. We don't have to follow the capitalist ideal of bigger is better. It doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes the few is better. Let Allah choose. You you do the work. You do the work. Be brave. Have courage. You do the work. And then let Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send you who needs to hear that, that message that day. If it's one person who needs to hear it, that's okay. That's okay. Yes, Mesina, exactly. So um, I'm going to repeat some of these questions because we do have a small, uh, we do have an audience here. And it's not small, it's beautiful, it's mm -hmm. perfect. Um, but yes, yeah, so sometimes Nisa is saying that sometimes she looks at services having to do a particular project or charity, but when we're saying it's spreading joy and helping one another, then it seems more doable. If every day on project level it is, how am I going to serve humanity today? Whether it's buying free coffee for the five people behind me in line, mm -hmm or it's actually going to someone's house and saying, hey, can I clean your kitchen? Or whatever, those things. Those are all blessed acts that, bring, that spread joy. And those are all, in spreading joy, we enter into building Medina, and we enter into following the, of the, following the prophetic way. I have friends that are trying to make their communities known that Muslims are peaceful. And they're thinking of making teachers etc. to say something to the effect of Muslims love peace written in colors of the American flag. What are your views on that? My views on that are the Muslim community is full of creative, interesting ideas. And there are going to be ideas that some people love and other people don't love. And alhamdulillah, you know, I, I, don't, have a, I don't have an opinion about it really. Muslims love peace, yeah. Every human being loves peace. I don't even know, like, if someone has experienced war, those people really know how much we love peace. I and mean, I'm not sure what your question is. Is your question about the t-shirts? You know, alhamdulillah. Everything, khair, inshallah. Can she, any effort, any effort is an, is an effort that I will praise. If someone is standing up to do something, I will praise that effort. Whether I personally would make t-shirts about that, I mean, I'm almost 50 years old, so. I probably wouldn't, but you know, I mean, that's probably my generation. So, uh, cookies to the neighbors. Girls at age between 14 and 18 have fears. How should we explain things? The girls between 14 and 18? I don't know. I mean, my experience with 14 to 18 year olds is they're pretty tough and they, is pretty, they believe that they can do anything. And I think we need to just give them that strength, give them that shot in the arm that says, you are invincible because they already believe it. So we don't need to take that away from them in any way. And certainly the issue of hijab, I don't see any questions about it, but the issue of hijab, someone who wears hijab should certainly not say to herself, I'm going to take it off now because I'm afraid. We, we Muslims are not chicken. And someone who's not wearing it, that's a completely different story. But someone who's wearing it and the only reason to take it off is to take it off because of fear. No. Muslims, we don't wear feathers on our backs. All right. Um, I think this life is meant purely for the hereafter. If we can remember that, the struggles we endure here seem little and so worth it. It's just not easy, but so worth it. You think this life is meant purely for the hereafter? This life is certainly a test for us in preparation for the hereafter, absolutely. But also, we are meant to be of the su'ada ad darin those who are happy in both worlds. So it's important that we strive for happiness, but what it's how we define happiness. And when we define happiness as leisure, 
and more and more and more and more, then it's really difficult to find happiness. When we define happiness as serving others and caring for people and that deep happiness that comes from true reaching out, then we can find happiness in this life that is deep and real and true and lasting and spreading. It spreads then to others. MashaAllah, MashaAllah Munira, that's beautiful. May Allah reward her and strengthen her and make her of the Salihin. In terms of the Fardain education, even the adults in our society are mostly illiterate. And that illiteracy gets passed on to their children. How can we make Fardain? Oh, okay. How can we make sure that our adults get that Fardain education? Secondly, what constitutes Fardain education? What is the minimum level of it? Uh, excellent question. I believe the answer to that is one on one, is one by one. One by one, really working and bringing people in and offering the program. So the programs have to be offered. We have Ribat, as in, there's an Arabic program with Ribat, and it's online. It's easy for women who tell me I can't, I don't have time. There's Ribat. If you have a little bit more time, there are local places. We have to learn Arabic. And subhanAllah, it's such a joy to learn Arabic. Once you learn just a little bit, it's a joy. Where's Leslie with, with her thing, right? Okay. Yeah, it's such yeah. a joy. It's a real joy to be able, I've seen her and the joy she has in, wow, I can understand this sentence, mashallah. So it's, I think we need to encourage people with, with teaching them, with sharing with them the joy of learning and not sharing with them the fear of it or, or the feeling that, oh, you know, I might not really get good at it. I might not be perfect. People might laugh at me. No, there's great joy in it. And Allah bishtah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open roads and make it even easier, inshallah. Uh, okay, so I missed that. In terms of... Okay, there's a question I missed over here that's over on this side. I want to know how we continue having the strength to keep our hijabs on after this incident and the hate on Muslims in America. I, we never, I didn't, and I'm sure you didn't, put on hijab in order to fit in. Because if you put on hijab in order to fit in, either you weren't leaving, living in America or you weren't looking around. When I first put on my hijab in 1985 in Minnesota, I used to walk up and down the same street that Daybreak is on now. And I would walk, this is a true story, I would walk past a store window and I would see someone in that window and I'd say, who's that weirdo? And then I'd be like, oh my God, that's me. I was the weirdo that I was seeing because I was dressed in hijab. So I think that the bravery and courage that you had to put on hijab in the first place certainly should not be diminished because of the outward acts of some of one man in, in Chapel Hill or another man in Houston or another person anywhere. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks of hijab in the Quran, he says, and يُعْرِفْنَا to be known. So we are to be known as Muslims. And that's a whole different type of harm there. It's about, it doesn't mean that we, that, that people who, will, that will never hate us for being Muslim. It means that we have psychological and spiritual, spiritual, spiritual is the word I want, spiritual protection from the deep, painful harm that can occur in societies. So certainly, the strength of it needs to be, perhaps we need to get together and find other women who are wearing hijab and go out together, what have you, if you're feeling insecure. But otherwise, pull up your boots, pull up your socks. No feathers. No feathers. Okay. Yes, it's worth putting effort, uh, more effort, so the Muslim community or outside the community, are they equally important? I think we need to serve both. We need to be serving the Muslim community and outside the community, and we're doing as much as we can for our whole community. And remember Sha'arawi's definition of the Ummah of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sha'arawi, if you don't know who he was, he was a great a mufassir, uh, mufassir, one who explains the Qur'an from Egypt. And... He defined the Muslim Ummah as including the non-Muslims. So remember that and hold on to that 
So whenever you're serving, wherever you're going, you are serving those who are Allah's creation. Allah loves them and wants them just as he wanted you and wants you. So be part of their path back to their creator, whoever they are. And or if they're already Muslims, be part of their the path that holds them connected to their creator. Or if they're if you if you're helping different races come together, be part of the path of of bringing Medina back. Thank you so much for speaking of all of humanity's being worthy of our love. Behind the polarizing discourse of Muslim versus non folks should we speak to the larger issue of violence and the aspects of modern culture, video games, that lead to this awareness of the sacredness of life, can become those who speak for all the family? Beautiful comment. Absolutely. Muslims definitely should be at the forefront of talking about the too much violence in video games. We should be at the forefront of talking about the violence in movies and on television and the the lessening of the sacredness of life. Absolutely, we should be talking about these things. All of these beautiful moral values that we hold true and sacred, we need to be talking about them and giving people the opportunity to choose another way. The human being loves beauty, loves purity, loves peace, loves morality. The human being loves these things. But we are losing a connection to find a place to find them. So we as Muslims are responsible to offer, to, to offer another way. We need to be offering another way. It's difficult to keep that feeling instead of entering for Jum'ah and there's the barrier. Often the Imam talks about inclusion of the community, all the while there's a literal barrier within the message I was finding real clear. So it's okay. Okay, first of all, Jennifer, I, my first thing that I would say to you is to speak to your Imam and Let's start having a conversation about the architecture of our mosques. This is an important conversation, and we need to have it, and we need to start talking about it respectfully, respecting the opinions and needs and intentions of the people we're talking to. But at the same time, we need to talk about it. When a mosque has a dirty or secondary space for women, the architecture tells women that you're not important. When there is a barrier that is such a thick barrier that we cannot even see the imam, it tells the architecture tells women they're not important. That being said, there are some women that really want that feeling of being behind something. They want that. So some, maybe we can come up with a compromise where there is space in the regular prayer hall for men and women, for, for women to stand. At the same time, there's space for women who don't feel comfortable doing, doing that. And perhaps also space for women with children so that children can learn how to behave appropriately in the mosque in a setting where if their mother's speaking to them and chastising them and encouraging them and telling them how to sit, it won't be disturbing to others. These are conversations we have to, definitely we have to have. As for people laying low, may I, we need, if we weren't missing so many fuddled prayers, we wouldn't be so chicken. So we need to be, if we're praying, or let me, let me put this in a more positive way. If we were praying our fuddled prayers, we would, we would have more courage. We would have more courage to stand up and, and be okay and, and remember the good in people. Remember the good in people. This is, there is no guarantee in anything. And it hurts when people hate on us for our religion. But we can have the conversation, God forbid, of shedding our religion. If you're black, you don't get to have that conversation. You have to be brave. You have to walk out there. You have to deal and interact with the society. So let's not, let's not pretend here. Let's not even have the question of what am I going to hide? Am I going to? This is, we have put Islam on as our skin. We have put Islam on as our skin and, and we need to wear it and hold it and be confident in it and know that there is great reward even in walking forward in that way. Yes. We are expected to explain why 
as Muslims are expected to explain why so much violence happens. Yes, and we as Muslims uh, need to, we, we are expected often to explain, and we can have one straight, clear answer that just says, uh, I hate, you know, we hate it too, or I don't know, we'll find some beautiful answer. I'm sure somebody out there has already created a beautiful sentence. I've seen some beautiful things from Imam Zaid Shakir. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't have one in mind right now, but that he said, that are excellent responses, and we need to memorize them so we just have those as responses. You need to not be sensitive about that. There are Muslims doing terrible deeds around the world, and that's a reality that we as Muslims have to face, and we have to learn how to talk about it, and learn how to move beyond it, and learn how to help our neighbors move beyond it as well. Well, we have, yes, we have Arabic now, Mikhail, and yes, inshallah, we are planning, thank you, we are planning, we're planning to do Arabic, intensive Arabic in the summer, bi'iznillah ta'ala, inshallah. That's right, Paula. Yes, we have, I agree. Okay, when you have close family members who discriminate against you, remember the companions did as well. And in that case, be the one who, be the positive agent. Be the one who brings good and goodness to your family. Bring gifts, bring kindness, bring food, feed, feed, feed again. Get up at night and pray for them. Get up at night and pray for them again. Ifshu salam, give them salams, give, bring peace. Ifshu salam, ta'am wa ta'am. Qum wa laylu nas niyam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad, the Prophet said that. Give, give, uh, Greetings of peace. Bring peace to your home. Feed, 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 feed food to people. And get up at night and pray when other people are asleep. So if you're doing that, you will find great changes in your family and in your communities, inshallah. Do I have advice on how women are because groups of men in the community push them aside as unimportant and relevant instead of simply leaving those communities do you have advice on how women can approach them and become a contributing part of society and benefit respect in a successful way the research on empowerment for women tells us that in and out of the Muslim community actually the research is on outside the Muslim community that women gain agency or the ability to accomplish things within their communities when they have expertise. So my advice is to bring forth your expertise. Start with expertise and as we gain respect of one another, then the culture in the mosque will change. We need to have respectful conversations. And I want to, I'm, I'm being reminded over here on the side here to remind you all of, we do have a class called Islam 101 that is actually open for non-Muslims. Ustaz Zainal Ansari is teaching it. And it is actually an, a class for non-Muslims that are interested in learning about Islam. So if you have people that are interested in that, registration is still open. It's late registration, but it's still open for three days. All of our classes are still open, but that's an important one in, line of what we're in light of what we're talking about right now. You may have people that you want to share that with. Layla, if you can if you can struggle through and not quit, then inshallah, may Allah reward you, and you will do what you need to do to stay safe. But I think that you, as an instructor at the German Saturday School in Canada, that's a wonderful thing. I'm proud of you for having that strength, and I'm proud of you for being there and doing that. Inshallah alayki. And I would say, don't quit. Keep going. This will die out, and they'll they'll come around. And you're a wonderful, lovely cheerful person they will they will remember they will know that about you and they won't they won't bring as as things move forward they will learn to leave their attitudes at home inshallah what do you do when you have islamophobic non-muslim in-laws viewing hate on fb if shu salam ta'am wa ta'am qum al-layl wa nas bring them send them peace be nice to them say nice words to them Feed them a lot and get up at night and pray for them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help them see 
goodness. Yes, Leila, inshallah. The best thoughts would be a good example. Do we need to be apologetic when there are horrible things done by Muslims in the news? I believe we should denounce it. Many Muslim organizations do. And it's not covered in the media. Do we as individuals need to constantly speak against these atrocities when done by Muslims, even though we may feel very far removed from them? I don't think we need to constantly speak about them. No. In your con everyone's context is different. In my, I'm, I'm back in school. I'm in graduate school again. And um, I don't talk about those atrocities so much, but I do talk about real life situations. And I do share who I am. I share the work I'm doing. And I bring chocolate and food and stuff like that. So those kinds of things are probably the most important. Yes, and I am going to stop before that next class at 8 o'clock because that class is going to start. And um, that's Islam 101 class, and it will be starting in about three minutes. So thank you all for joining me tonight. And I, ho I, I hope that this live stream at least gives us something to think about and something to work for, and at least it's a beginning, inshallah. And we can continue to talk more about these things. And may Allah reward you all, inshallah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the souls of all Muslims who die and from hate crimes or war or racism or anything like that, accept them in the in the highest places of Jannah and comfort our hearts that our hearts recognize that and know that so that we're not trialed by their deaths but rather we are energized into proactive movement by the deaths of those that you love thank you